I think that ultimately having a really compelling story, a really interesting project is the reason why projects go viral. And in these uh, algorithms, are pretty good at identifying content that is resonating with people through their metrics like watch time and engagement rates. And so, you know, there's a reason why Nicholas Newbert's projects go viral every time he posts it. And it's not because just his name, it's because he posts incredible projects that really blow us away. Hello. In today's episode, we had a uh very honorable guests. We may think you know them. Uh, they are everywhere on the AI bubble, the Curious Refuge, Shelby and Caleb. It was a very funny conversation, to not say the least. We had a lot of unexpected balloons. If you're watching the video, you'll see them. And uh, yeah, Mauricio, how, what's your thought about this conversation? Hello, yeah, it was super nice. I'm actually working with them as a teacher on Curious Refuge, so and I met them in person last year in Barcelona. They are really, really nice people. And we talk about like going viral, how to go viral, the, the whole thing about virality and social media in this AI era. And, and how they gave us really awesome tips on which platforms to focus on, how, how things work to go viral. So lots of tips and tricks for you all. And yeah, hope you all enjoy. All right, let's go. All right, uh, welcome to one more episode of Zero One Cast, uh, the podcast of Zero One Cine, uh, a place where humans create and machines dream. Today we have here two honorable guests, I will say, uh, which is this two folks from Curious Refuge, Caleb and Shelby. Uh, we are, were looking forward for this conversation for a long time. We are really huge fans of the, the work they are doing with teaching and keeping us updated. I personally watch every Saturday morning the videos to update myself because it's too much. Uh, they have like, high-quality content, uh, high-quality teaching. So, yeah, we are looking forward. There's many things to talk about, including the elephant in the room, Sora, which we will get into it soon. So, yeah, welcome, and Mauricio, give some short intro, and let's let our guests also introduce themselves. Yeah, hello, I'm Mauricio Tonon, and I'm really excited for this special episode. I think we can talk about really interesting things, and it's always good to have a talk with peers that love to, to teach. So I'm really excited to have Caleb and Shelby, which I already met in Barcelona last year, and it was an awesome meeting. So super glad to have you guys back. Thank you both for having us. It was so nice meeting you, Mauricio. Honestly, like, so cool to connect with people who you've seen their work online and you're blown away by, but then to finally be like, you're a human and I see you. And it's, it's so sweet. And thank you both for having us. We're super excited to chat. Yes, so excited to be here. And the work you guys are doing with Zero One Cine is is really incredible and ahead of its time. And I think that uh, it's it's a great service that you guys are offering uh, the world, which is amazing. And uh, some people may not know, Mauricio is actually uh, a TA uh, inside the Curious Refuge program as well. And his insights are super, super great uh, because he, of course, just has uh, amazing experience uh, mm -hmm. in storytelling. And so uh, it's it really is an honor to, to be chatting with you guys today. It's really cool stuff. Thank you once again very much for your availability. Uh, we know you're, you're busy, and yeah, life is busy now, this AI life. So thank you again for your availability. So yeah, let's, let's start. Uh, I, I would like to start with a question which I'm asking every guest uh, from our podcast. So you, you are off, this is the fifth episode of our podcast. And I always start with this question, which I think makes some sense. Before deep into AI, let's talk about you both before AI. So mm. how was your uh, work routine and creative process like before AI? And, and how did it change after AI? Or basically how AI is changing your life? And I think for you both it's changing quite a lot. So tell <laughs> us a bit more about it. That's yeah. so... <laughs> it's such a good question. I love this story because we were... So our background is in creative education. So... Shelby and I have both run uh, online animation schools, online visual effects schools, 
really empowering people uh, at the highest level of the industry to tell their stories and to learn that really the technical, you know, meat and potatoes behind uh, getting their their work out there and, and landing jobs in the industry. And we were having a really good time uh, with that. But obviously, all this AI stuff started popping up. And, you know, like so many people, we'd mess around with, you know, Dolly and Mid Journey and early versions of chat. And then in 2023, things got real. And, uh, oh, oh, there's our little dog, Chester. Hi, Chester. Sorry, he's like sitting at my feet, just like, hold me. <laughs> so I, had to, I had to. I mean, how could I say no? He's, he's the mascot of Curious Refuge. One more guest for us. But... No worries. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's yeah, a 12 year old chihuahua for those listening <laughs> and he is an angel sent from heaven so <laughs> yes he's our, our purple mascot uh in our <laughs> icon but uh yeah so we basically were uh assisting artists in the visual effects space and we started seeing some of the early experiments with ai whether it's the harry potter balenciaga or you know uh Family Guy as a 1980s sitcom, like those styles of videos. And we were so curious because it was the first time in history that people were watching purely AI-generated visuals and really responding well to them. And so we were really curious to run an experiment to see, okay, if people are watching, we'll call them meme concepts, would people actually get excited for a film concept? And so we went to AI and, you know, AI was used to like come up with the idea, the visuals, the voice, and we really tried to inject it in every aspect of the creative process. And from that was the very first Wes Anderson Star Wars video. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that one went mega viral and kickstarted a lot of conversations in the industry about, uh, you know, the future of storytelling and AI's yeah. role in it. And, and it, it was, was funny that, that when it went viral, we were sitting on our couch with some friends playing Mario Kart <laughs> and Caleb gets a notification that's like, oh, the Hollywood reporter is writing about your video. And so it was like, wait, what? So that was a really cool moment. <laughs> yeah. And, and so, you know, over the course of about two weeks, you know, AI was like for so many people that are part of this community, uh, a fun side project that you're doing experiments with to, you know, national news companies are coming to our house and asking for our opinion about what this means for the future okay. of storytelling. And it was a, a, a very quick transformation. Mm -hmm. But what was so clear in those early days, especially doing these experiments, is that AI is going to have a central role in the future of storytelling. There's no doubt in my mind. I, I don't think anybody that actually truly messes around with these tools can arrive at a, a different conclusion. That It will be used in storytelling, and the creative potential is, is really astounding. And so we wanted to create a place that really supports artists through this new transition time. You know, we are changing a workflow in a way in which we've told stories up to this point in time and introducing new workflows, new tools, new dynamics. And so like every other transition in history, that's going to require education and support mm -hmm. and empowerment. And we want to be the optimistic and encouraging home on the web for people going through that transition. Yeah. We always see it like, you know, AI tools are over here. I'm, I'm like, my hands are on opposite sides, right? <laughs> well, of course, um, that's how hands <laughs> work. Um, but it's like artists are on one side and AI tools are on another. And our hope is to be a bridge to support artists to like learn how to utilize these tools. Mm -hmm. And so that they feel like encouraged and supported as things change and not just kind of like left in the, the wild thinking like, okay, everything's changing, but I don't know what to do. Like we want to build that community of like, let's figure it out together. Mm -hmm. And so that's where Curious Refuge was born from. Great. Yeah. And it's really funny because, you know, talking about what our workflows were like before AI started happening, Shelby and I traveled the world for like nine months. We were digital nomads. Mm -hmm. The work was not crazy challenging because we'd worked in um, education for a while and had a great time doing that. 
I don't think there's any chance that I I could do a weekly AI film news and run this school now. Yeah. And so, you know, everyone talks about AI optimizing your processes to help save you time. Mm-hmm. But I think at the end of the day, most folks that start to use AI, they get it turns into their hobby, their passion, and they Every probably have less than we've ever worked in our lives. <laughs> but we're having so much fun doing it. So Okay, that that's amazing. Thanks thanks for sharing this story. Uh, yeah, my, my second question, in fact, it's quite uh, close to what you said, but you can go a bit further because I think that's an important moment uh, for, for you. So, yeah, you had this, like, the first AI trailers went viral on Twitter. You were talking about, I remember the Wes Anderson, and, like, how, how did you felt when the video went viral? And were you expecting that? And, like, if you have, do you have, like, any tips or advice and how, how to like market and then like make this content reach more people. Yeah. So I, the virality of that project was completely unexpected. It really was just an experiment. Like I went to bed the night I posted it and had 200 views and I was feeling pretty great. I was like 200 views. That's awesome. And then I woke up the next day and it had 500,000 views <laughs> and, you know, it was going viral on many different platforms. And uh, by the end of the weekend, of course, it was like written about in, in a lot of publications. And I, I think that the interesting thing is, because a lot of people talk about, you know, how do I go viral? Because a lot of our projects do go viral. And a lot of times people focus, focus on the strategy, like, oh, what hashtags are you using? Are you tagging the right people? Are you you know, uh, what time are you posting? And while that stuff is okay for optimizing, what I think is way more important is creating something that's incredible and worth sharing. Because <laughs> at its core, that's what virality is. It's someone sees something and shares it with another person or their community who sh- they see it and share it with their people. So I think that ultimately having a really compelling story, a really interesting project is the reason why projects go viral. And, and these uh, algorithms are pretty good at identifying content that is resonating with people through their metrics like watch time and engagement rates. And so, you know, there's a reason why Nicholas Newbert's projects go viral every time he posts it. And it's not because just his name. It's because he posts incredible projects that really blow us away. And so I, I think like one just encouragement I could have to folks, like if you're wanting to go viral and be a part of cultural conversations, explore your curiosity and make projects that resonate with people. And they don't have to be like the most photorealistic cinematic imaginings. Like storytelling happens sometimes despite the quality that you're able to pull off. Uh, people are very forgiving if your story is is really compelling. And so you know, I, I think that when you start using these AI tools, you see the limitations, you work around them, and, and you uh, can figure out what will resonate with people. And and actually, Shelby's um, Millie Vanilli project that she posted back in September, I think is a really good example of a project that really resonates with people. I don't know if you want to share some of that, Shell. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, it's just the story, right? Like, What's interesting about that project is, you know, I was sharing the story of Millie Vanilli, who I don't know if you all know the story of Millie Vanilli, but the singers Robin Fab, right? They're lip syncing, but they won a Grammy for this music that they never actually sang a single song of, right? But they were just stage performers and they were um, captivating and marketable. And so um, they were used as the face of this band. So that was such an interesting story to try to tell because you're you're really trying to represent the session singers well who there's not a lot of um content out there to work with so you're generating images to tell their story um and what was wonderful is on the comments the original session singers two of the women um commented saying how much they appreciated and loved the film and so that felt really awesome to have feedback from the people i was telling their story using ai um, commenting and saying how they really appreciated it and how it was very accurate. Um, I think that meant a lot as a, as a filmmaker, right? Like you want to, especially if you're telling people's story, you want to do a good job representing them. And so, um, yeah, that was a cool, that was a cool story, but. Yeah. And I think that's a really cool example of a story. And a lot of times films are like this on distribution platforms, whether it's Vimeo or YouTube, 
the films that are really the most incredible and the most uh, engaging aren't necessarily the ones that are the most popular, but that doesn't make them less important. And we see that when it comes to long form feature films as well. You know, the, the films that really resonate with people and that tell deep human stories sometimes are not the ones that are the biggest box office hits. Uh, and so I don't know if it's a great idea to simply pursue going viral. I get that from a marketing perspective that can be very helpful for you in your career. But I think we've seen more opportunities open up from some of the less popular projects that tell good stories and that really showcase the potential of resonating with an audience on a human level versus the stuff that just, you know, people get excited about, you know, a new Legend of Zelda rematching or something. Yeah, because I think even with Millie Vanilli, like last weekend, I think, I was able to present that in front of the Television Academy here in L.A., and showcase the project, which was really awesome and a little intimidating because you're standing on the stage next to like Emmys, you know? Um, but that was a really cool moment, but it was because that project, yeah, it was, it was a great story. Um, but it wasn't one of our like most viral projects, you know? Um, but I think you're right, Caleb. Yeah. It's good to, to work on and telling good stories, um, and not just going viral, but going viral is an interesting experience. And I, I don't know if you want to speak to like, there's not a lot of support and, and material out there for like, what do you do after you go viral? Like, how do you yeah. manage kind of that influx of like folks reaching out, looking for support, looking for how you did something, commenting yeah. positive and negative on your work? Like, that's that's quite an overwhelming experience. So it's, yeah, yeah. it's very interesting. I actually didn't even think we were going to end up talking about this on the podcast, but I, I love it because I think it's really interesting because I do think there are going to be AI creators that probably do go viral Uh, over the next few months. Uh, And and so maybe we can kind of lay out a a blueprint and just kind of explain what what will happen. (laughs) So I think there is a bit about the the intention as well. I feel like when you really do truly something for you or which you think is funny, of course, you can think about the strategy. Oh, this can go viral and stuff like that. It's valid. But I feel that maybe when you less expect as when things like hit truly like uh, people or go viral, I, I personally... My, my first AI film was a music video for my band, The New Horizons Earth, and it was like totally experimental project. I was just, okay, I will try to make a, a video clip for my band, and if it sucks, I will not share, and if it's nice, I will share. So I sent to some friends who were like critical, like real feedback uh, friends, and they said, no, it looks cool, you should share it. And then I share, and again, like, it was like, I don't know, 50,000 on Twitter or something like that, and I was like really not expecting at all, like, I was most of the time just speaking by myself alone on Twitter and like a lot of people commenting, even like Nicholas, and I said, oh, this guy made these cool films and he's commenting my tweet. And even like, I think I also like tagged you, uh, Curious Refuge, hey, take a look on this. And you say, hey, good job. And I was like, happy, oh, that's cool. Like these guys know what they are doing and they like it. It's, it's nice. But then uh, uh, just fun story, I was also surprised because yeah, as I said, usually I watch on Saturday morning uh, with my, my girlfriend, uh, the Curious Refuge videos or Sunday morning. <laughs> And we are having coffee or preparing coffee. And then I was just watching, like, normally, as I do every weekend. And then I saw my film there. And I say, like, what the fuck? Like, the guys post my film, but they didn't tell nothing to me about it. But, like, they, they share it. And it was, like, it was really, like, surprised and spontaneous. I was really happy when, when I saw it. <laughs> yeah, we need to do a better job at uh, reaching out and being like, hey, we're featuring your thing this week, and, like, uh, to, to get you excited. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, that, that project was really amazing. And I think that it's interesting because when you go viral, there's so many different types of people that start reaching out to you. So yeah. you're going to have uh, agents reach out to you. Uh, you're going to have brands reach out to you and want, you know, some sort of like collaborative project or they saw your thing and there's like some campaign that they think your style would be appropriate for. Uh, you're going to... Uh, more than likely have people that want to ask you questions for news articles. And so you have to like very quickly gather your thoughts about what you believe about all of this stuff. And so, you know, obviously like a lot of our thoughts are gathered from books that we've read and uh, content that we've consumed about art and the future and conversations that we've had with people. And so there's just, yeah, all of these different types of people that, that will be reaching out, but just, you know, do your due diligence and do research on the types of people that may uh, contact you because 
you know, a lot of people will try to get you to like, oh, sign this contract and you can be a part of my agency and stuff like that. And it's just like the typical like musician contract thing. Like they're just like super predatory. So, you know, I, I would say like if you're going through this and you ever have like questions, like try to find support communities of people that like can guide you through that. And whether that's Curious Refuge, Zero One City, like people that can kind of guide you through that process, I think is uh, really important. And, and I think intuition, like, you know, we all have like that gut feeling when something's right or wrong for us. And I think in the beginning, Caleb and I were invited to a lot of different meetings, right? And it's like, oh my gosh, you're in Hollywood. What does this mean for us? This is a great opportunity. But then you get in there and you're just like, oh, this just doesn't feel right, right? And so you'll know that feeling. Hopefully you have that intuition, right? And you can feel when something's good, a good fit and not. But then we've had meetings with people in Hollywood and we're like, this is amazing. And absolutely, this is a heck yes. Like we're going to move forward with this. Yeah. And so honestly, a lot of our, a lot of our um, actions after going viral come from just like, a feeling in our, in our body and, and seeing if this is right for us, you know, Yeah. which I don't know if that's helpful, but <laughs> I, I think that's good. Shell. And one other thing just to note is whenever you do go viral, like, yes, the, the praise and like all the positive aspects will come to light. And then with any, anything that's going viral, like part of the reason things go viral typically is because there's going to be two sides, like people that love it, people that hate it. People that hate it are going to share it just as much as people that love it because they want to like love to hate it. And so it's, you got to be prepared for just that feeling of dealing with negative comments at scale because mm-hmm. you may have never, never had a thousand negative comments on something that you've put together. So that's a weird experience. And, and even for us, like, you know, we put together some of those early projects as experiments, like true experiments in the craft and we had like people like making documentaries about like why uh, we are destroying like art and filmmaking. And it's just like this whole crazy thing. And, and unfortunately, a lot of those people, they don't, they're not, they're looking for clicks themselves, right? They're mm-hmm. just, they're looking to just have people share their stuff and go viral. And so they're willing to be divisive and, and, and harmful and not recognize the nuances associated with uh, new new emerging technologies and platforms. Yeah. And, and so you just have to be prepared for that. And so uh, I, I don't know if that really there is much of a way to prepare, but, you know, you just get get ready and, and hopefully like have artistic support networks that can guide you, yeah. like just core people. I think it helps having each other on our team. So it's like someone genuinely did make a documentary about Caleb and saying like he's destroying art and cinema and all this. And and that was really challenging, right? But like having each other to support, be like, hey, that's not true. Like, let's let's keep playing. And like, what was really cool about that story too, which I really admire Caleb in this, is he like commented and was like, hey, I, I wish you would have reached out, but but thank you for sharing like your thoughts. And then he like sent the person a journal and was just like, hey, best of luck with your channel. Like, you know, really wishing you success, which is like such an A plus move. <laughs> like, I was just like so kind and and generous and thoughtful. And like, that's our hope with everything. If there's negativity, we're just going to try to like be optimistic in it. And like, really, I don't know, like take the high road, I guess is how you'd say it, but just do what we can to infuse optimism, even when we're, you know, getting, being met with like negativity and hate for anything. So it doesn't happen a lot anymore. I feel like we've been getting a lot. We've been building this community, right? So like, I feel like now there's like a lot of encouragement. It's like you, I don't know, you start to shape the culture around you, you know? And so we really feel that. And like Carrie's Refuge, it feels like a really awesome, like supportive community, uh, which is incredible. So, yeah, I can attest to that being on the Discord channel and seeing everybody super happy with all the, the feedback and everything and the support from the community. So, great job, guys. Great job. Uh, love all the Thanks. stories. I think having the feedback from, from your the people that inspire you to do a film is one of the best things that you can you can have, right? Um, I would like to talk about a little bit your roles in Curious Refugee as chief marketer and chief and COO, shall we? Like what what you guys learn from the past schools, like from Rebel Way, School of Motion, and all of those great schools that you work before to apply here and how it's different from the AI landscape to the normal, let's call it, uh, usual uh, landscape that they had before. 
Yeah, I think at Curious Refuge, what we've learned from helping run multiple companies, like education companies, is we where like we don't make it very complicated to run our business. We use tools to optimize and create systems that keep it so we can keep showing up and giving a lot of value. So if if our operations are taking away from our opportunity to like give value and engage with our community, we want to figure that out. So I think that's a big difference at Curious Refuge. Like we're really, um, like we're willing to subscribe to tools that help us do our jobs faster, which is cool. Um, yeah, I don't know. What do you think, Caleb? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with that. And I think that for us, we want to learn from places that we've been at and implement, uh, processes and 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 really to develop the community that we always dreamed of having yeah. and so that's exactly what curious refuge is it's kind of this amalgamation of of all of the things that we've learned over the years and you know we have grown very quickly i'd say that's a very unique part of what we're doing at curious refuge a year ago it was a side project so zero employees uh and now i think we have like seven people on our team maybe eight people and oh. It's been really cool to see the expansion and um, the the reception from the community uh, because of just you know how how timely these conversations are uh, regarding artificial intelligence and storytelling and so uh, it's been really sweet and uh, I, I think that for us like the next phase of what we're pushing into beyond just supporting people to learn the tools is supporting people in their artistic journeys. And so we want to create a stabilizing presence, whether it's having life coaches in our program, Mm -hmm. mentorships, like we want to think about a long-term relationship with the people that are inter interfacing with our company. That's interesting. And we want to also support the physical, like in-person interactions as well. And so we're starting to do meetups. We did our, our first one actually with Mauricio out in mm-hmm. Barcelona, and that was super fun. Uh, but that was very impromptu, uh, kind of last minute. But we want to do more. So we have one in Montreal coming up, one in Poland. We have nice. a, a, what I think is probably going to be the biggest uh, AI filmmaking party in history uh, that's going to be happening at, in Las Vegas on April 15th. Yes. We just secured a venue, nice. so it's it's happening. Contracts are signed. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Congrats. Yeah, yeah. And and so I think these these in person experiences are a really important part of Curious Refuge. And there's yeah. something that was less present in some of the other brands that we've worked with in the past in the digital ecosystem. But I think it's going to be absolutely vital for us as artists uh, going. But I. I think that we would not be able to run Curious the way we do or even be here if it wasn't for all of the experience from these past schools. Like it's, it's amazing to see how Caleb and I both like our experience has really brought us to this moment in such a, like, Mm -hmm. um, with such synchronicity. Mm -hmm. I, you know, like it's just wild. It like, I don't know. It's, it's just really cool to see how everything from the beginning of our careers when you didn't realize what that was preparing you for, you know, it's like, there's a reason. I feel like all of your experience eventually will come together and and you'll be like, Oh, that makes sense. Now I had to go through that and and learn Mm -hmm. that. So I could be here to do this well, you know, and that feels very true with what we're doing at curious. Cool. Yeah. I think I agree. Steve Jobs talked about this also on this, this inspirational videos that when he was like on the typography classes on the school, so everything was helpful for when he was building the Mac in the end. And uh, I also feel a little bit like that, with like creating the zero one scene, like creating the brand, creating the website, creating everything around it. That, so I've been working with, like, with big brands for like 15 years as a user experience designer. And I basically can put all this experience, all this learnings on my own project. And this is really rewarding. It's a different motivation, it's a different energy. And it, I, sometimes I feel also like, Everything I learned, even small things here and there, they are useful here in some way uh, now for me. It's really, it's really nice. Absolutely. Mauricio was frozen. I'm trying to uh, revive him, at least for me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Mauricio, I think you have one more question, right? Yeah, so um, after you guys going viral first time you go went viral again and then again and again (laughs) so 
after this this all this virality do you have any and just talking about the marketing social media aspects of stuff do you have any tips you give to people that you know maybe aiming to do that in the case not that it's indicated for everybody but there are some people there is their goal you know and it's not, nothing wrong with that i think so if you have any tips for that i think it would be quite nice we've learned a lot that you kind of have to grab the attention of folks very early on in these trailers so we were actually um when we released barbenheimer for the first time we had this like slower intro version which i actually enjoyed i liked the way that looked a bit more but um it it's unfortunate like you have a few seconds to grab someone's attention, right? Mm -hmm. Especially on social media. So we immediately were like, oh, that's not good. That's not doing it. Like immediately could see that. And so we were willing to like pull that down super quickly and like recut for that intro to be snappy. And at the time we were actually looking at, um, Napoleon was being released. And I don't know if y'all remember the trailer for Napoleon. Mm -hmm. She's like, dune, 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 like cut, like really quick cuts in the beginning. And so that was sort of a reference for like, okay, we're going to cut Barbenheimer with this kind of very mm -hmm. quick montage -y grab the attention and then move into the trailer. And honestly doing that, that simple change, I mean, it, it, the, the trailer took off. And so, um, and Caleb, I, you can speak to so much more when it comes to creating content that's yeah. going to take off. Yeah. And to put a perspective on that, that went from, I think the first time we posted it, it had maybe 1700 views. And then we, we felt like it, it should have more. And so we did quick recuts to really just shuffle the beginning, just to tighten it up a little. And, uh, I think on TikTok it had maybe over a million. I'm not sure at this point. I mm -hmm. haven't uh, viewed it. So you're looking at close to like a 500 times increase in the amount of views because of uh, a simple edit change. Mm -hmm. So obviously like that's a, a really important uh, part of, um, you know, uh, just thinking about the early days, like not early days, early minutes really of when you post something, mm -hmm. that initial feedback will tell you a lot about the long-term trajectory of your content. Mm -hmm. We've also found some some really interesting tips. This might be helpful for folks uh, listening. So you can get out your pens and papers uh, now <laughs> to take notes. So uh, we found that on Reddit is where a lot of journalists go to find stories, which is interesting. Uh, Twitter, yes, mm -hmm. but Reddit's very potent. And Reddit is the most democratized uh, platform. Whenever you post, you have just as much of a shot at rising to the top as anyone else versus Twitter, Instagram, you know, YouTube, the followings that you have can kind of kickstart some of the, the virality. So if you're new, put your stuff on Reddit and you can, there's different channels. Like for example, if you use mid journey, you can put it in the mid journey channel. Mm -hmm. And I think there's like sub channels for all sorts of different, um, types mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, AI platforms at this point. Put it out there, see what other people's stuff, like comparable uh, projects, how they do, and it kind of gives you a baseline for knowing, okay, did I put this together cor correctly? Like, is this going to resonate with people versus, uh, is it, oh, that's fun. I have no idea how these things happen. It happened with me quite often. <laughs> No, oh, I thought you just really enjoyed that tip. And, uh, no, you but, the, <laughs> but the crazy stuff that this happened on my Microsoft Teams, on my work meetings, and now it's happening here as well. I don't know. That's great. No, I love it. Maybe it's maybe AI is just listening to what it's we're when saying. when I do it's some just... gesture, I don't know. AI virus. <laughs> Thumbs up sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, so, yeah, like Reddit's a great tool for testing. Um, and then yeah. like, obviously Twitter, like that makes total sense in the AI space. If you want a job from your work, like if you're creating spec projects, post it on LinkedIn and there's a certain language in posting on LinkedIn. When you post as an individual, it tends to do well. I have a huge pet peeve that I have to talk about when you post something on LinkedIn, do not post a lie and then walk it back with the rest of your, your content. Oh right. So I've yeah, seen so many messages <laughs> about people that like, they'll be like, I just like, I just hopped into Sora and it is absolutely mind blowing, implying that they've been testing out Sora. And then they like the rest of their information will be about like why they don't have access to Sora. And I'm just like, that is not going to work in the long run. Like if I see posts like that, I love hitting the spam, the misinformation button because like, it's just so sketchy and that happens so much. Uh, so clickbait. please don't do that. Yeah. LinkedIn clickbait. Click yeah. Clickbait. 
Yes, it's so annoying. Um, but but yeah, like obviously posting on all those channels. But I, I would say that the best place for long term success as an artist, uh, as it relates to getting your content seen by more people, having more opportunities, is going to be YouTube. Because it has a huge advantage to other platforms. So if you go viral on TikTok, for example, that the the adoption cycle and the the life cycle of that content is going to be about forty eight hours max, mm -hmm. and then you just fall off into the abyss mm -hmm. until you come out with something new. The lifetime and... of the content, right? Exactly, and it's it's not very forgiving. <laughs> and so, uh, if you post your next thing, it's not guaranteed that it's going to go viral as well. Like it's it's really really quite challenging. Uh, and... Yeah, but YouTube is also five times more profitable than the film industry, and so that's wild, right? And I think that's AdSense alone. Is that right, yeah, Caleb? Yeah, mm -hmm. it comes to just AdSense, five times. Like, so think as a creator, like that's the platform to show up on. You know, and, and I think building niche communities to fund eventually your projects, like that's where I think we're going to see um, people creating more films in the future. Yeah. And, and I think the, the people that do this best and they utilize AI as well as the Corridor team, you know, mm -hmm. they've worked on really incredible AI projects like the Rock, Paper, Scissors anime project. And that really propelled them to a, a national spotlight as it relates to AI. But they also have a very core community that gives them like a certain amount of money each month and like this kind of hybrid Patreon experience mm -hmm. that they help to fund their uh, their film projects and their ideas. And it's a it's a relationship. So I would really say, like, try to post your stuff on YouTube. It may not go as viral on YouTube, but it more than likely will be more in the long run effective for you on YouTube mm -hmm. compared to single Twitter posts, you know, that go viral and, and don't do anything for you uh, in the long run. Um, but that being said, Curious Refuge, we've had opportunities pop up on every social platform. So like when you post something, might as well just share it on all the platforms and, you know, play the games that you have to play on the platforms. And it's amazing. And I would love to hear from you both your, your experience, but we were talking um, with Matan yesterday at Pika and he was saying how, you know, by the time he created his third AI film, I think that was the one we featured on the web show. He then was brought on to be the creative director at Pika, which is amazing. So like this stuff is moving quickly and there's a lot of real opportunities for folks who are putting these films together and getting their work out there. And so, um, yeah, that's just incredible. After three films, he's like able to yeah, be creative. We also seen members of the community also join Curious Refuge team, uh, like Mauricio, like, uh, other people I know online. Uh, it's really, for me personally, I have this feeling that uh, each social media has kind of like a persona or a personality. And also, I, I think like, first, like, thanks for sharing these tips. I think they're, they're really valuable. I hope folks took note. Uh, but like, like Twitter is this like anxious, like personality and everything is fast. And okay, things can go viral for a day or even for like, eight hours, 10 hours, and then they're gone. And then what's the next? What's next? What's next? This is like super instantaneous uh, rewards, but even like virality. So there's no like much lifetime for your account. And then it's gone to this void, right? Of the algorithm. And uh, I think the advantage of YouTube that it's there and maybe if there's some tags or related videos, there's many people watching the lifetime of your content will be longer. If you get on the grace of the algorithm and to recommend you to watch next from other people, etc. So it can be like reverberating for a long time on YouTube. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's and but I also see like LinkedIn is also like this more serious like persona, right? Like on the photo, but if you see uh, other photo of the person will be different. And for me, I also post some things on Reddit sometimes. I, I use Reddit for maybe almost ten years, uh, and like. The Reddit, uh, for me, it's uh, like talking about these personalities. For Twitter, it's this like, anxious per person. <laughs> Facebook is the, is the boomers that are already believing on AI image generated and commenting. And then, like, on, the, and then on, on Reddit, for me, there's, I feel a lot of hate. There's a lot of hate there as well. There's a lot of opportunity, but the, the places that I have more haters is on Reddit. Like, like what the fuck is this? This is trash. Wow. <laughs> and on Twitter, yeah. maybe sometimes they even think, but they don't, I don't have much haters there. But on, uh, and, yeah. and on Reddit, I, I had some posts that went viral as well, like thousands that I never expected. And it was not like AI, it was other kind of posts. But uh, 
Sometimes I, I, I'm afraid to post on Reddit uh, because I need to deal with the haters. <laughs> yeah, Are I you definitely... on TikTok or Instagram as well? I want to hear their personalities. And also, I am in my head prompting for these images. I'm like thinking of uh, Inside Out characters and I'm like, yeah. okay, so what would that look like? That would be really fun to prompt. I, I think I've seen there's like some people that will use AI to create like the average Reddit user and then like the average YouTube user. And they're mm -hmm. really funny. Um, I mean, I got to see that. Yeah, <laughs> I, I totally agree. I think on, on Reddit, it can be negative. You just have to make sure that you're putting it in the right channel. So make sure that like you're putting it in an AI focused channel. Mm -hmm. And the tonality that we approach Reddit is posting as if we were, let's say, uh, a young person who created this project and they're so excited to share it with their friends. Like that's kind mm -hmm. of the tonality. Like if you post it at all, as if you were a brand, forget about it. Like, mm -hmm. it's just going to get downloaded. Like, it has to feel like it's, like, one person's little, you know, project that they just can't wait to share with the class, you know? <laughs> and that tends to get people uh, excited. But it is it is really tricky. And I, I do recommend doing a research. You know, I think if your goal is to go viral, people like Mr. Beast, like, they put out these projects. But the thing that you don't realize is, how much pre-production and analysis went into them becoming who they are today. Mm -hmm. They would spend mm -hmm. every waking hour analyzing YouTube content and meticulously thinking about thumbnails and release strategies and cuts, and they'd have spreadsheets and have a group of people taking mm -hmm. notes before they ever had a, a, a video go live. And so I think that it's really important to think about your distribution strategy and the, the type of content that you will put out uh, and not just like think about it as like, oh, I'm going to create this masterpiece and then I'm going to share it with the world and everyone's going to love the masterpiece and they're going to like, you know, give me a round of applause. And like, I don't think that's a very wise way of thinking about releasing your content because you do have to play just a little, like some games uh, to get your stuff seen. Not a lot. Like, if you're really jumping through hoops, there's probably a problem with your content. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're not jumping through any hoops and not doing any, let's say, hashtag research or not, <laughs> you know, think, putting any thought into your thumbnail, well, maybe just put a little bit of thought, you know, do a little bit of research. So, uh, yeah. So it's definitely not just build it and they will come. But also, like, it's not trick people into, <laughs> into watching your stuff because that will ultimately, it, it'll hurt you in the end. No, definitely. I uh, uh, also think uh, more and more also this AI age and also this TikTok generation, everything is fast. And uh, like you said, you need to attract the attention on the first five, eight seconds. Otherwise, people drop this reels TikTok generation. So I think mm -hmm. also like you need to have strategy. You need to, like people like you need to think about things and have your, your strategy very clear. And uh, yeah, it's not just like rent about random posting. Right. And yeah. yeah. Right. Let's, I, uh, I totally agree. Yeah. I, I totally agree. And I think one thing that might be helpful for folks listening to this podcast is to know how important certain channels are. Because I think for a lot of people, especially because TikTok seems to be like the big trendy uh, platform to try to go viral on. For us, and I'm just speaking from our perspective, if we get a million views on TikTok, it's not as important as getting 10,000 on YouTube. And I think that the business opportunities that can pop up uh, whenever you are um, have less views on some of these other platforms like Twitter, like YouTube, uh, like Reddit, I think more opportunities open up uh, than just going viral with shorts where people are super distracted, highly engaged, you know, like mm -hmm. getting a million views of someone watching your thing for two seconds and mm -hmm. swiping up is very different than... 10,000 people on YouTube watching your three minutes. And how time. much of these like people the, will convert to follow you, to get fidelity to you, to subscribe to your newsletter, etc. It's more just like, yeah, cool, next, right? Yeah. <laughs> kind of, yeah. yeah. No, very, very valuable tips, I think, for everyone. I'm also learning a lot here. But let, let's talk about the elephant in the room, <laughs> which is Sora. <laughs> so I would like to know, uh, Shelby and, and Caleb, uh, What's your, what's your personal take on Sora? How, how do you think it will impact and change the film industry? How fast is it going to be? I think we are all surprised with this giant leap that they had. Even us, that we are inside the bubble, I think we are not expecting that. So, yeah, how do you think it will change how fast 
And also, what are your concerns about it? I mean, the generations we're seeing are pretty incredible. Um, but I just, until we can like really test it and see exactly what's happening with Sora, it's hard to fully understand how it's going to impact things and change things. I know, what was it, like, generations are taking, like, at least an hour for a few, what's it, seconds of video. So, I don't know. I think I think until we get to really get our hands on it and explore, it's hard to know exactly what it is. Um, you can only have judgments on about it when you're from the outside looking in, you know? So, we've seen the generations. It looks interesting. It looks incredible. I mean, I think I'm... The one that stands out to me is the little Dalmatian going from the window seal to the like next win- window and how the animation looks so good and how he has like, there's anticipation and you can see the hesitation in the, in the um, animation, yeah. which is very impressive. Um, and so it looks impressive, but yeah, it's hard to say. I don't, what do you think, Caleb? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I think... Sora or technology that is similar to Sora uh, is going to change the way that we tell stories. And I think it's going to happen in in sequences. So the big reason why Sora is not in the hands of people right now is not because OpenAI is incapable of packaging a video generation tool. It's because they're legitimately concerned about uh, misinformation and what this, the impact that this could have on society, which I think it's a good thing that they haven't fully released it because I think that it is good to weigh impacts of what your tools can do and, and the impact that it will have on society before you release it. Uh, I think that's really wise. Mm-hmm. But... The truth is, you know, whether OpenAI releases Sora or Runway, you know, version three comes out and it's close. The folks at Google are working on AI video generators that are incredible. Yeah, MidJourney's working on theirs and it's supposed to be awesome. So Sora-like video generators are right around the corner, even if Sora is not going to be Mm -hmm. released in the next three to six months. So I would say that, the way that this is going to go down. First, uh, establishing shots, details, world building is going to almost entirely be AI as we move forward. So if you need to set a scene and and build a a world Mm -hmm. for your film to live in, you're going to use AI. And then you're probably going to shoot interior shots, dialogue, the emotive human connected scenes through traditional pipelines, maybe it's virtual production and some sort of hybrid approach, but like it will more than likely be, um, you know, with talent because that the ability for AI to really resonate with human emotion and expression, you know, beyond just a few little tech demos online, it's not quite there. It will be there though. And so we feel like world building comes first. And then you are mm-hmm. going to begin to see much more controls in the performance of the characters and uh, having the ability to go in and meticulously uh, change the performance. And that will be another milestone. So that'll probably be the next big milestone once Sora uh, comes out. And then integrating all of that into a single pipeline where you type in a prompt and then you can see a compelling film. And the way in which you give feedback on that film Perhaps it's different than the timeline experience. Maybe you literally are looking at the shot and you say, hey, uh, instead of the mouse running around there, can we like replace it with a rabbit? And it's going to be this multimodal experience. And that's still directing. That's still you seeing an output mm-hmm. and communicating what you want to see. I mean, that's what a director does. Mm-hmm. They're standing <laughs> they're standing here and they're like, I, I want to replace <laughs> the mouse with the rabbit. It's just a person goes and grabs the mouse and puts the rabbit, you know what I mean? Or like, yeah, yeah, you know, totally. whatever. And so it, you're, it's directing. It's it's the exact same thing that we've done up to this point. It's just the way in which we do it. The way in which we express that story is completely different, and the velocity is very different. So that's my, how I think things will be adopted over the next, uh, I'd say, two years is probably, two to three years is a, a healthy timeline. We'll probably see, like I said, Sora six months from now, maybe by the end of the year. I know with the election, they might be waiting a bit to, yeah, to totally get past agree. that, which is in November, which is totally understandable. Yeah. Uh, but but we'll see. You know, I mean, their hand might be <clears throat> might be forced if, if Runway comes out with some sort of cre- incredible uh, next generation video tool. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's like race. All these tools are just <laughs> in a race to yeah. see who's going to be the best one. 
which is helpful because I think with AI, it's very easy for monopolies to begin to pop up mm-hmm. because a, a small head start with AI goes a long way. Like a great example of that is uh, ChatGPT. Uh, if you look at Google Trends, which like tells you like how much people mm-hmm. are searching for, uh, ChatGPT it, on its worst day is 11 times more popular than Google Gemini. Mm-hmm. And that's Google, you know, like that on Google's platform, I'm getting this data. Yeah, <laughs> uh, people are using Google to search for more ChatGPT, which is crazy. And so I think that first mover's advantage uh, is really potent more than ever before. And so it's really important to have competition uh, to help distribute uh, the innovation so that one company doesn't have too much power. Uh, And that's going to be a big part of just society and the way that we view adoption uh, going forward. Yeah, just just some quick comment here. But Maurice, I would like to know your takes on Sora. And then I also want to share a bit of my take on it very quickly. But yeah, I, I just want to add that it's a great time to be an artist. It's a great time to create. You have like this billion big companies competing to provide tools for artists, you know, like Runway, Mid Journey, Google, uh, OpenAI, etc. So like, I think it's quite unique to see so much like big companies competing and, and also, also every week there's a new tool on Twitter, right? Like every week there's something new, there's many already. Like I have this bookmarks here of like thousands already, even like text to video or image to video. But I think that's good for artists in the end. Uh, yeah, like good time to, to be creative, to create, to play with these tools because there's plenty of tools and there will be more. And as you say, maybe Runaway can even come something better than Sora very, very quick. No one knows. And, but yeah, it's good time to, to be creative. But Marisa, what's your take on, on Sora? Yeah, I'm with Shelby. I think until I can wrap my hands on it, it's just speculation. But uh, And they claim like that there's no addition in this. Okay, I can get that. But they're posting one video that is one in how many generations maybe they had to do like 100 to get one good so we we don't know for now we don't know and i think also like as an artist i really like the empowerment that sorrow will do in terms of movement and scene composition and creation but i'm 100 percent sure i will not use it to generate my final AI movies, for sure, we'll do all the stylization with another tool like ConfiWire or something like this to have more control and differentiate my, myself from, from everybody that's doing the same thing using the tool. You know? so I think it, exactly what you, you told right now, that all these companies being, being competing with each other to, to create things give you options. So it's good to not be like, oh, I just use this or just use that, but test everything, use the right tool in the right moment to the right output. I think all these things are quite, quite great. And having a lot of options is what, what will give us creative freedom in, in the end, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, my, totally my, my personal take on this is like, yeah, I, I was really impressed. But again, it's a lot of speculation. I think it's also starting to be a bit pathetic, to be honest. I feel like this kid on the school, yeah, I have a chocolate and you don't have it. Like every day they are posting these videos. Uh, and there's this bunch of artists here, early adopters working for a long time that cannot touch it. So it feels like, and like they're just like teasing, 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 and showcasing. Yeah, but we already know it's it's great. But like, uh, this like how long will it take? Maybe end of the year or something. But my main concerns are like uh, the user experience of it. Uh, I don't like much the user experience or user interface of GPT at all. I feel that uh, there's a bunch of engineers and not many designers there really thinking about. Uh, how it works, how it could work. And uh, I, I worry about how it will be the user interface, how the user experience of this tool, because I'm, it's also my profession. But I'm worried about like performance, the price, and also like style control, camera control, all these things. You need to have this nice UI to make this work. Uh, and also, if you want to do cinema, if you want to do film, uh, life is dirty, right? Life is sweat and blood. So like. Uh, how many words will be censored there? Like uh, maybe you you want to create something that's really your artistic vision, but it would just not be possible because some word on your prompt or something, which you don't have like bad intentions, but it will be blocked for security or for ethical or concerns. So I'm kind of also a bit worried about the level of censorship we're gonna get with this this tool, and yeah, and the style control and everything. because all the videos they look like this realistic cinematic, and it's not 
uh, like we are looking for, but as you said, you can use a bit of this, and then you can use ConfiWi to make more crazy, stylization and stuff like that. But I think these are my main concerns, the price, the user experience, the, the performance, and uh, the censorship. Yeah, yeah I, I totally agree. And then uh, the, the time to, to generation is, is a tricky one. More balloons. <laughs> What? I what have no happening? idea, really, how this thing. Is. I love it. it. Just like it gets excited about certain things that are said, and just oh. like throws the <laughs> open AI. They're listening. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that the render times uh, is really curious, and I get that a VFX pipeline is used to dailies. You know, you you work and customize all day, you hit render overnight, and then in the morning you review, and it's this back and forth. Like, it is a slow process. However, I think that having to wait one hour for a generation that you have limited control over, and what I mean by that is not that you're not typing in a prompt and not inputting your input image, but if you're a director and there's a very specific output that you're looking to get from tools like Sora, you want to be able to very specifically direct the actions that will be taken. And people and don't know, but very usually we create several generations to get the ones exactly. we want, right? That's the one you have like 200 before that for one scene. Exactly. And that's the beauty of AI is the reason why we do that is one, to get creatively inspired and two, to see our imaginings come to life. And so, you know, we're, we are trying to convince computers to give us this. And so sometimes it does take 200 images before we get the, the one we want or, you know, 100 generations in runway. And that's a part of the AI process. Mm -hmm. and, and I think, like, it's similar to having takes, like whenever you, you know, have, you're working with uh, footage from a film. And it seems like Sora is going to have some real bottlenecks uh, when it comes to giving you takes, mm -hmm. uh, especially, you know, GPUs, like I, I just don't think there's enough GPUs in the world to facilitate the, the demand mm -hmm. for the videos that will be generated by Sora. And maybe that's why uh, Sam Altman was asking for like $7 just, trillion. Just a little something. bit of money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just the GDP of like Japan. <laughs> so, so yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. I think from a marketing perspective, OpenAI knows exactly what they're doing. And the reason why I know that is because you can look at how popular OpenAI is and ChatGPT in Google Trends. Mm -hmm. And it's this interesting wave where every time they start to dip down, a news story happens. And it's almost predictable. <laughs> like the, the amount of time spaced between all these announcements is uh, predictable. And, and we can see that from the data. And so it's not an accident. These companies know what they're doing. And it they just happened how... right now with the Cloud Day Tree, the lunch, and now people, there's a lot of memes already on Twitter, like people like poking uh, sun, hey, where's GPT-5? Because there's this big announcement <laughs> or anthropomorphic. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm sure a couple of weeks from now, they're going to have some new, I don't know, thing with more tokens or, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know, Shabi, if you want to add something. Uh, otherwise, I would switch a bit the uh, conversation. You already you already touched uh, on this topic, but uh, what was your your the both of you? What was your main motivation to decided to create Curious Refuge, and and how do you see Curious Refuge in three five years from now? Mm, good question. Yeah, I, Curious Refuge is really just uh, an extension of who we are. Um, I mean, the name was thought up uh, over dinner sitting in our home, you know? So, um, I feel like it really embodies like our personalities in a way too. Like, I don't know. Um, it's funny because Caleb and I are the kind of people like, you know, we've been married for over 12 years. Um, and we've worked together really like since we were kids, I mean, we were working on short films together. My brothers were like talent in your films. And like Caleb was like, you know, using after effects to make everyone fly or whatever. Um, and so we've always just worked together and we're the kind of people who like, we'll go, our date nights will be like, Hey, how can we optimize laundry? It's like a super frustrating process. Like what can we do to make that better? Cause it feels like a bad experience right now. And so that's just what we do. It's just kind of who we are. And maybe that's annoying, but <laughs> well, I'm, I'm an ex designer. Um, so, I, so I do the same, or maybe I, even worse. <laughs> yeah. But it's like, it's always like, we love solving problems. We love curiosity and, and thinking about how things could be different. Um, but we also like 
that safety is important, right? Like you have to have safety to have a conversation. Like even when it comes to laundry, like, Hey, this is a hard experience. Like how can we make this a better, um, workflow for each other or whatever. Right. Like, so in everything, like having safety and refuge is so important. And then having curiosity and asking questions and learning about things is such a like staple of who we are. And so curious refuge is just an online home for that. And so that's how we started. Um, and really just seeing this, you know, and like we said earlier, like having been in the education space for so long and seeing this opportunity to kind of be a home for AI filmmakers, for AI storytellers, um, it was just very obvious that there's going to be a need there as these things are changing. And, and even at Curious Refuge to eventually like provide sort of like coaching support or like some sort of mental health support. Because I think it's incredibly destabilizing everything that's happening, right? Um, if you're an artist and this has been your career and now these tools are changing the way we do things like that can be an overwhelming thing to experience, but we hope at Curious Refuge, we're creating a home for you to like come and to like belong and to explore and to like feel supported on that journey. Um, and so that's, that's a bit of Curious Refuge. Yeah. Would you like to add something, Caleb, uh, about your motivations? Yeah, I, I think Shelby really nailed it. I, we want to have an online home where people can embrace curiosity, uh, can find people that will encourage them, and really establish this new prototype for what a storytelling industry looks like. It's it's funny, Caleb. Um, we have like a friend who, I don't know, this is like, she like hugged me and was like, Shelby, you're like the human version of sunshine. And then hugs Caleb and is like, you're like the human version of Xanax. <laughs> and I think like that's such an embodiment of who we are in, in the world. And like, I think with everything changing, like we want to be that. We want to be like a calming, joyful presence for folks. And so uh, not needing to give Xanax to do that, but like hopefully with our content and our training. You know, Curious Refuge, yeah, your yeah, drug of it's choice. It's nice to know a bit more your about uh, to know a bit more about the name. Uh, it's nice to, to have the stories behind the name. And just a quick remark, and Maurice, you go for your, for your question. But when Maurice also joined uh, some live event you guys did on the Discord or something, hey, I will join the Curious Refuge class today. And be really nice and say, oh, that's cool, congrats. And then after that, hey, hey, what's the, how was that? And say, yeah, it was great. Like, people were really curious there. And say, of course, man, you're like in the curious refuge. <laughs> of course they are curious. Yes. <laughs> we, Appropriate. We've ran into this interesting thing because, like, everyone wants to name, like, our community and the people that are involved. And, like, the obvious thing is to call them refugees, but that's a horrible name. And so we're, like, curios. I don't know. We're trying to think of, like, what the, how you name the community because it's just, uh, you know, yeah. you, we can't go with the obvious. I, I thought about this bad joke, but it's good that you mentioned, not me. So. <laughs> right. Yes. Bad jokes always come from me. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome, guys. Yeah, so, so getting to the more the final of the interview... You guys kind of become like representatives of the AI and especially AI filmmaking for everybody outside the AI world. Like so a lot of content, a lot of uh, contacts in the Hollywood and other big companies, uh, streaming companies and filmmaking companies. So wh what's your take from the inside of these things? Like how, how these big gigantic industries are adopting AI? How are their fears and what tip do you have to like people that maybe want to work on Hollywood with AI in the future? What, what do you think will be the necessary skills to be there? Yeah, it's, it has been fascinating because we've connected with, I mean, most of the high level people uh, in the industry that are thinking about using AI in their productions. And there's so many interesting components and, and misconceptions. The first is I really felt like okay, we are innovating with AI and, you know, doing some interesting projects online, but behind closed doors in Hollywood, there must be these teams of people that have developed Sora-like experiences that are, you know, unavailable to us, but, you know, let's just say, like, uh, I don't know, DreamWorks has this, like, AI pipeline where they type in a prompt and they get a, a, a kid's show and they're just going to crank that out. And the truth is, like, that was not the case. Like, the technology, the, the true innovation came from these private tech companies. And the studios were completely caught off guard. Some of them started getting into machine learning and AI 
and some of them even disbanded their uh, their teams because of how challenging it was to to pull this off. And so, what's so interesting is one, the playing field. <laughs> Every time the balloons pop, up, it's great. It was a very inappropriate time for balloons to pop. Up too. I have no and he's always on Caleb, this... always on Caleb. <laughs> it likes my words. I will need to Google uh, it or like... ask ChatGPT later. Uh, what? Why? <laughs> it's like maybe there's a keyword I'm saying that's like the balloon like uh, password. Uh, so you know, I, I I think for us, it really shifted our mindset because we realized that the curious refuge community, the emerging AI filmmakers on the internet, were the ones who were actually at the forefront of storytelling. And that was a very interesting uh, thing to learn through getting connected. Uh, the other thing is, these are huge entities, the bureaucracies, there's levels of um, tape that you have to go through in order to get a story out there. Uh, I was chatting with Chad Nelson at OpenAI, and we we're talking about the film industry and how, you know, the average person probably has to go through around. <laughs> I can't with the bullets. I'm sorry. It's so funny to me. No, I'm just gonna, like, I have the giggles. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> Chad was saying that, uh, you know, about 24... See, now I'm just going to laugh about the balloons now. Like, <laughs> be serious, Caleb. Be serious. I'm thinking about silly balloons. <laughs> and I was uh, trying not even to move much to not trigger this balloon, but it's not working. <laughs> I don't know. Words. No, you're good. Uh, but anyways, uh, Chad was talking about how basically there's 24 people that like are in the press. <laughs> Why am I laughing? So much? <laughs> <laughs> oh no! It's okay. The magic of editing. <laughs> Next man. time I will bring real balloons <laughs> and I'll put them. <laughs> that would be perfect. Oh my gosh! No anyways, worries. long story short, we're working with people, and you know, it's it's cool to be at the forefront of storytelling, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's fun. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's inter it's been interesting to see like when you have um, large teams, right? Like Caleb was saying, like this is these are like established bureaucracies. Like there's like a pyramid top down structure to how things work. It's really hard to pivot when you have systems like that in place, mm -hmm. and these AI tools are requiring a lot to pivot. Um, and I think small teams working together who have the ability to be kind of agile and, and change quickly as the tools change are going to see a lot of um, opportunity and progress in their work more quickly. And so, yeah, that's what I think. No, that's a good point. I think I was even thinking now, maybe if these big studios, they create some small startups, a lot of big brands do that. Like when they are yeah. like yeah. slow and like have this old image, they create this like insurance companies and stuff. They create this small startup where they put some money and then you have a new brand. So, okay, we are digital. You can hire insurance online, et cetera, et cetera. And I was thinking maybe it could be a good strategy for these big studios. Like you said, so hard to just pivot. But, okay, let's create this small startup. Let's, like, found creators. Let's, like, start this thing from scratch. And But, yeah, it's part yeah. of Universal. It's part of et cetera. And, yeah. yeah. And I see, I, I don't know. I think this is one of the big barriers still for these big guys also enter this is like I mean, they will not create a full AI movies like just from nothing. Like I, I see they creating these small slices of AI generated content on production. So maybe like say a setting or a scene which is very hard to shoot or a scene which is very expensive to shoot, they maybe will start to add the small like layers, thin layers of AI on their productions because it's cheaper, because it's faster. And uh, and then slowly this Slices will get like bigger and bigger, and at some point it will be it will be a whole thing on AI. But I don't see this like big guys in like totally one hundred percent AI like this. Like, no, yeah, no, it's gonna take a while to to adopt, and and there's so much pushback uh, against AI uh, in the industry that it, it, a lot of really talented artists are in a really tricky place. We were just talking about this in our office hours at Curious Refuge, how these tools when they are paired with talented storytellers allow you to elevate your creativity to like an incredible place. But so many incredible storytellers in the industry out of fear of rejection from their colleagues or being yeah. ostracized from this ivory tower of Hollywood aren't able to explore 
these tools. And I think it's it's a bummer because I think that the stories they would be able to tell would be absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. And I think that they are doing themselves a disservice. Like that's not going to stand the test of time. Three years from now, like saying that you're against AI would be like saying that you're against smartphones today. You know, like it's just like, like, yeah, you may be like more on like a, a larger, like philosophical, like, oh, I want to get back to our roots when people like we're at the center of cognition. Like I understand that dynamic, but ultimately like AI is going to be involved in tools, like just like uh, digital and filmmaking. Already you know? involved in the VFX and everything, right? For a long time. Yeah. yeah. And so it, I really feel like it's just an unfortunate place that artists are in who work in the industry. And uh, it's a really tricky place for studio executives too, because they, they see the future. They, they see how AI is going to have a hand uh, in, in storytelling, uh, but they have, a ton of people who are going to push back against that. And then at the same time, films are having a harder time than ever before being profitable. And so they need tools to come in to help streamline the process, which is AI. And so it's this weird flywheel. And so the larger studios, uh, I, to your point, I agree, are going to have to either have split off startups mm-hmm. that are starting from the ground up. And we've already seen some of those start to pop up. Mm-hmm. Uh, or... Or they're going to have to uh, shut their doors because I think it's is such a, an important part of uh, what is happening uh, in the industry. And, and I think we have to embrace change or the, the ineffective and the, the challenging economic model associated with content production now. Uh, it, it won't last. It can't last. You can't, you're not, you can't just burn money every single time you put a project together. It's so. like when Photoshop came out. Like, we will not do our advertisement drawing on paper anymore. Like, and it's no way back, right? Like, like, like I think it was Milan saying, like that. The, I feel like there's this tsunami on the horizon, but you should be building your boat, uh, not like fighting against it, because sooner or later it will come. Yeah. And maybe you can, I can shout out a quick uh, question to Shelby. Do you think most of the haters are, are people like worried that they will lose their jobs or stuff like that? Or how do you see this? Like, because it's a big change and it's fast. Like, it's a tsunami. Maybe it's a good yeah. metaphor. Uh, and like, how, how do you see this disruption on the, on the marketplace? Uh, how do you see these people might maybe migrating between careers and stuff like that? Yeah, I do think it's people who are, you know, artists and, and who are creators and who are directors and writers and who see this wave as well and are witnessing creators use these tools. But I think they're just like, maybe like Caleb was saying, maybe they're, because of their network or their position in the industry or their position within whatever field they're in as a creative, right. Um, will be impacted. I think there's like an, it's, it's like a totally normal, like it's totally, um, okay to feel overwhelmed by that change. I think it's like, it makes sense. It's a, I think we're all going through a paradigm shift and I think the fear, and especially when it comes to like negative comments, I think oftentimes it's just like a projection of our own fear or anxiety, mm-hmm. you know? And so I think that's like what's happening when people are kind of negative about something so, so quickly without exploring it themselves. It's typically just like their own like projection of, mm-hmm. of what's going to happen to me. Am I going to be relevant? If the, What does this mean about me? What does this mean about all the years I've spent, you know, learning this, learning this yeah. craft? And, and it's putting them in a vulnerable position where you have to learn something new. And, and now you're maybe at, at this starting line again with everyone else. And, and I get that. That's, that's vulnerable and that's overwhelming. But um, my, my challenge to people is like to just play around with the tools because they're so fun. And I think once you begin to explore, I think with anything, we can talk about this with anything, like exposure creates like awareness and familiarity with something, right? Like when we're standing at something like we were saying with Sora from a distance, we don't really like understand it. So when we're standing at, as a creative, looking at AI from the outside, it's easy to have a lot of projected judgments and fears. But when we're inside learning, experimenting, playing around, we can start to see how this will elevate our work. And it is a fun, um, fun experience overall. And um, that's what I see. I think people are just going through a paradigm shift. We all are in society. I think every single industry, you know, mm-hmm. like, I mean, we're having this conversation on this podcast now about filmmakers and artists, but like you think medical conferences, they're having conversations about AI too, you know, like this, these tools are going to disrupt every industry. And so I think the entire world, we're going to be going through some, a shift 
of how we, we look at things. And so, and paradigm shifts are overwhelming. And so it makes sense. So our, and my hope is to like tell people like it makes sense if you're overwhelmed by it and also like dive in and explore. Cause I really do promise that exposure will help create some, some understanding, which will create some ease. So that's a good, that's a good view. Uh, thanks for sharing. Yeah. It's natural to be afraid. I think uh, it's changing so quickly and we I also see impacting every industry and, I personally prefer to have an AI doctor with uh, help with a human doctor, uh, because like right. how, how many medical studies your doctor reads every day, zero or even every year, two, and how many? On, imagine an AI that is learning all these single PDFs and studies that every day, so it's like you it can you it can compare it, but of course not this like pure AI. Mm -hmm. I want my doctor assisted by this AI that is learning wow. all the studies every day, millions mm -hmm. every day. So on this sense, I'm more for, for AI, for example, and just sharing some, some quick story that uh, I think also fits. Uh, I was in some Twitter spaces and some guy, I don't remember uh, the name, I'm really sorry, but he was telling this story that, so he's making like prints with AI in mid journey and he opens the, his car and expose on like parking lots and places. And then people like buy his works and talk to him. And there's some old lady was crossing and say, hey, I will like destroy our jobs. No, 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 no. And then he, instead of reacting, he like tried to have a conversation with her and, hey, sit down here, let's have a coffee, let's talk. And then he yeah. explained to her that he was unemployed before AI and now he can make his own yeah. art and he is like imprinted and people are buying and now he is making a living of that. So it was for him, it was the total opposite. Yeah. It brought you, brought him to a new horizon, also yeah. financially. So, right, I think that's something also people don't, don't think much about and I think the curve, it's very quick also to adapt, to, to learn, to play, like you were saying, like before the like industrial revolution, it takes you a long time how to operate a machine, right? And then with the technological revolution, yeah. technological revolution, it takes a, quite some time to learn a tool and master it, like After Effects or 3D Max or whatever. And now we are prompting everything and like, and the, the, the curve, it's very, it's basically you just need to know how to describe things or how to express yourself or, so like text or talk, which is natural. So it's not like learning how to operate a big machine on a factory. It's not like learning how to master After Effects. It's about prompting, which is much simpler. like, you can learn if you want in a few days or a few weeks and you can master it in some way. And it also depends on your background, like, like photographers, filmmakers, they're much better on prompting than a regular person that is not. And so all your knowledge is still valid, all your skills about filmmaking, all your skills about photography, all your skills about music, about photo, all of this is still relevant for your AI career. And it's also a very important topic. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think we hear people say like, you know, um, oh, it's going to replace storyboard artists. Well, like as a creator, I, I was, it was never available maybe to me to have a film where I was able to employ to a have storyboard one artist, first right? But now, I can, but now I can create a film. And so I, I think like there will be opportunities to still work with storyboard artists, right? If you're producing something, but like, for individuals or indie filmmakers who never really even had access to that, it's creating opportunity for you to create your film and build your project without, it's, it's creating jobs for you as well, um, without needing to like go through those traditional um, pipelines. So yeah, yes. All right. So we are approaching the, the end of this like prison conversation uh, with the Curious Refuge. Uh, let's go for our, our latest, last question. So uh, very quickly on AI creativity. Do you think that AI boosts creativity and how, how do you see this relation and like, how would you try to convince a hater or someone that AI is good for the industry? Absolutely. I think it's incredibly creative. It boosts so much creativity, like things I don't even think about. Um, when you're working with AI, there are hallucinations, right? That you find when using these tools. And I think those inspire new ideas. And if you follow those kind of pathways of new ideas, like there's new stories to tell. Um, I think it's incredibly creative and super fun. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, the folks that use these tools, uh, the creative projects that they're able to get out there are incredible and uh, would not have existed uh, with, before these tools. So very creative. <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's awesome guys. Uh, so what are the things that you, both of you, want to do that you didn't do it well, apart from Curious Refuge or in Curious Refuge, they are 
kind of planning for the future. So maybe a, a wish or a dream that you wish you realize and that we can share with us. Mm. A wish or dream with Curious Refuge or outside of Curious Refuge? Do you... Yeah, I mean, I think my dream for Curious Refuge is that we will never lose sight of empowering people yeah. and being a optimistic and safe place to explore and contextualize what is happening in our world. And yeah. so there are so many people and, and so many opportunities to be negative about the future or insecurity or just the changes that are happening. And we think that that criticism can be valid in some cases, but we want to be just a home where people can go to find optimism for the future, uh, for their own creative stories and to empower people to tell stories and, and give them opportunities that they would have never had available to them. Uh, before uh, mm -hmm. this this technological revolution. Yeah, and I want to continue to help support artists, like elevate their stories. Um, it's cool to see, you know, these AI filmmakers that are just all over the world, like showing up and telling such cool stories, incredible stories. And so continuing to find ways to like, support them, elevate them, like help them continue to learn and find jobs and um, create awesome work. And so... I see that. Um, maybe working on a few short films that are inspiring. Um, I also personally, like, I kind of want to try fusing AI and, like, vlogging. I want to see what that's like. How can you take this, like, really authentic experience and, and create, like, these vlog-like experiences with AI? So that's, like, a personal thing that I won't really do at Curious, but maybe on the side I'll, like, explore, see what that's <laughs> like. But, yeah. I love it. Cool. Would you like to work in a big production, like a Hollywood production? Or something like that. It's your movie on the cinema. <laughs> we we've been asked countless times at this point uh, to to work on a feature and to you know make Curious Refuge into a big studio. And while I like having that door open, I think the truth is, for me personally, I get way more satisfaction out of seeing the impact that my work has on empowering other people to mm -hmm. tell their stories and to get incredible films out there. Uh, but of course I, I love storytelling as well and would love to, you know, work on larger projects. Definitely right now with uh, how busy we are, that definitely <laughs> is an impossibility, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see that soon. Chester wanted to come back. He's just like, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your your work definitely inspire and, and helps a lot of people, including myself. Uh, I'm following mm -hmm. since the very beginning, I think. So yeah, you're you're doing a great job. You're inspiring, you're teaching, you're, you're training people, you're sharing news, you're keeping people up to date. It's very uh, beautiful and important work uh, and you're like early on this. So, uh, so what will be your advice for an expiring uh, filmmaker or AI filmmaker? Which is interesting just to, exploring AI. Yeah, I think just start somewhere. Like, start in chat and, and take a picture. I, I don't know, like, take a picture of your room and be like, what's the story happening in this environment? And um, what characters live here? And, like, mm -hmm. do things that, like, like, think outside of the box. You know, we use these tools with in the ways we've been taught. But, like, there may be new ways to use them. Um, and so explore. Like, I was sharing earlier, like, maybe a prompt of an image inspires a story. Allow yourself to kind of go on these like tangents with these tools, with these AI uh, tools and see what, what comes out of playing and experimenting. That's what I would say. Yeah. And, and I would say, I mean, I guess this is a bit of a plug, but if you've ever desired to learn AI filmmaking, check out our AI filmmaking course at Curious Refuge. I, I truly believe it's the best way to learn core storytelling techniques and fundamentals in addition to the latest technology. And so we hope that it's a fuse of, of both traditional storytelling concepts and uh, the latest tech. And uh, we really uh, want that to just be a resource uh, to folks. Yeah. And so by the end of the four weeks, you're able to create a short film uh, using AI, which I think is just really awesome. Yeah. And 100% approved because I made it in <laughs> November and now I'm helping to... Yes. Thousands of the students, so yeah, all good. Uh, guys, 
Thank you so much, Caleb. Thank you so much, uh, Shelby, for being here for this inspiring conversation we have today with all the internet problems and things we had. It was <laughs> super balloons. fun to have it and balloons and everything. And <laughs> we like to, to, to open up the, the mic for you guys for any message you want to give to, to people. Mm. I think I would just tell folks to stay curious, you know, have fun explore but also like take a break get outside look out of a window like it's not as doom and gloom as we make it you know and it like go stare at a tree it's gonna be okay <laughs> we'll put some grass right. yeah <laughs> pet your animal there's chester <laughs> stare at him for a while you'll 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 calm down pretty quickly <laughs> i totally agree <laughs> Would That's you like pretty... uh, something, Caleb? Any any final thoughts? I think that if you look at the patterns of history, there's always a cycle of initial fear related to new creative mediums, followed by exploration, and then adoption, and then the expansion of your ability to tell a story. In almost every new innovation, whether we're talking about the printing press digital cinematography, um, it, it all follows a very similar format. And so we're seeing that with artificial intelligence and it's challenging to be in that season, uh, but push into optimism, like Shelby said, stay curious. And I think the world wants to see the stories that are inside of you and we can't wait to, to see them ourselves uh, at Curious Refuge. And If we ever can be of assistance to you and, mm. and helping you to get your work out there, to be seen by more people, um, and to open up uh, those opportunities uh, to to really make an impact with your story, please reach out to us because we would love to assist you in that process. Love it. Very, very wise words. Uh, thank you. We strongly recommend uh, Curious Refuge uh, content. Subscribe to their YouTube. Uh, a lot of nice videos to keep you up to date every week. It's hard to follow everything. Uh, so stay curious, look for ref Refuge. And we always uh, end our episodes with a quote from someone famous or inspiring to when you press the stop or end the episode, maybe we'll keep thinking, it will keep reverberating on your on your on your mind. So I will go for this uh, uh, quote. Before that, thanks again for your availability, for your work, everything you're doing for this community. Uh, we really respect truly your work. Uh, and we know you're busy, so thanks again for your availability. So our ending quote today is from Pablo Picasso. The chief enemy of creativity is good sense. That's That's our words. Think about it, reflect about it. And I think, yeah, that's what our show for today. Thank you again, Shelby and Caleb. Thank you both so much. This was so fun. Yes, thank you so much, guys. <laughs>